Welcome back, my friends, for part three in the Now is the Time Prayer Conference Series, Idaho Conference. We're excited to be here with you, and um, I hope you've had a good day. Hope you had a good lunch and uh, didn't hit the springs too hard so that you're revived now and um, able to take in more of the Word of God. Just before we begin and have prayer, I've got to share with you a text message that I received from one of my pastor friends here in, in Washington after this morning's session. I received the following text message. It says, thank you for being used by God in your message this morning. He gave you a holy boldness that disturbed, rather troubled my soul. Praise be to God. And I thank God too that that was the reaction because I, I believe that God is wanting to wake us up. And I want to press the issue just a little bit further and say I, I want to disturb your peace a little further. Is that all right? The title of tonight's message is The Time is Now to Disturb the Peace. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us here this evening. It's been a good day. It's been a good Sabbath. And this whole experience, its I, I pray that it's like Jesus taking the 12 off by themselves where he could speak personally and deeply into their lives, into what he was trying to explain about the kingdom of heaven. And I pray that each of us have been receiving um, your message to our hearts and that we are feeling like we are being prepared for your soon coming. So be with us now again, um, this second session of the day, the last one of today, and uh, let your spirit be here um, to, to speak to us in ways that will, yes, disturb our peace, but will inspire us, Lord, to be about your business. So thank you for being here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We may not have chosen the time, but the time has chosen us. These words spoken by the late congressman and civil rights icon John Lewis reflect the zeitgeist of 2020. The zeitgeist is the spirit of the times. We didn't choose this time, but for some reason known only to God, he chose you and me to be here now. Have you thought of that? I remember uh, back uh, earlier in the year when the senior class of 2020 was um, having their peace disturbed because a lot of the year-end events, the school year-end events in the spring were canceled. Mission trips were scrubbed. Graduation plans had to be redirected. We had to do a drive-in um, situation to honor our graduates instead of the normal process that we all would have loved to have been a part what they were expecting and anticipating for all their lives coming up into school and I remember I made a video a short video um, for the campus ministries department addressing the senior class and the student body addressing their disappointment and in that video I said you know there had to be on the earth, in those closing hours of earth's history, right before Jesus comes again, there had to be a group of teenagers <laughs> going through school at this time. There had to be a group of young people who were on the earth at the precise time that events were rapidly shutting down. And I said, and who's to say you could be that group of young people, this generation, to usher in the kingdom of God that we've been studying about and praying about and reading about and preaching about for 2,000 years. And so I don't know why I look back and I say, man, why, why couldn't this have happened during uh, the Whites, James and Ellen White's era? Uh, why not during Charles Spurgeon's era or George Whitfield or the Wesley brothers 
I mean, when the church was alive, when it was on fire for God, when, when, when revivals were sweeping the eastern coast of the United States and all throughout in the first Great Awakening and the second Great Awakening, why not then? Why now? When we're the most distracted generation that's ever lived possibly the most lukewarm generation. Distracted by the internet and Twitter and Facebook and, and, and ev you know, everything. Why now? Well, that's not up for us to know. Like Jesus told the disciples, it's not for you to know the times and seasons of the Father's own choosing, but you will receive power and be my witnesses when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. That's what you need to worry about, is receiving the power. And this afternoon, my friends, 2020, here at the 6th Annual Idaho Prayer Conference Retreat Weekend that's coming to you virtually, right here and right now, Jesus says, you are to receive power. I don't have an answer for why you and I are chosen to be here right now. But we've been chosen to be born again. We know that. We learned that from this morning. We've been chosen to rediscover the fundamental essence of what it means to be a Christian. <laughs> Just to come down to the basics. What does it mean to be a Christ follower? A disciple of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? We've been called to rediscover that to examine ourselves, to see if we be in the faith, not just in the church, a lot of people in the church, but to examine ourselves to see if we be in the faith, the faith of Jesus, the faith that Jesus possessed when he was here on the earth and said, Father, not my will, but yours be done, that faith. But God and the time may have chosen us for something else. May I suggest that we're here to do something else. John Lewis said to get in good trouble. <laughs> the direct quote was, never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. And at this time of testing, when God is revealing what's in our hearts, what's in the hearts of his people, I'm under conviction that we need to be disturbed. Is it okay? If the Spirit of God disturbs our peace this evening, it better be we don't have a choice. <laughs> We're being disturbed whether we like it or not. You remember sports apparel giant Nike. They stirred the pot. They stirred controversy with an ad campaign featuring the voice and face of quarterback Colin Kaepernick, known for his national anthem protest by kneeling to bring attention to racial injustice. Superimposed over a close-up of Cap's face are the words, believe in something, even if it costs you everything. Now the ad sparked immediate controversy and lit up the Twitter sphere with calls for boycotts against Nike from some and praise from others. Now whatever you feel personally about Nike or Colin Kaepernick, it is clear that they were willing to depart from the status quo. And all this got me to thinking about revival. We talk about it a lot, especially at these prayer gatherings, these prayer retreats. But what do the two things have in common? Revivals generally get started when the status quo becomes unbearable. I'll say it again. Revivals generally start when the status quo becomes unbearable. It's called the crystallization of discontent, the crystallization of discontent. In other words, you can't go on with life as normal. You've, you, you've got to do something to alter the pattern that you're in. The pain of staying the same has overcome the pain of change. And you're willing to do anything to change and get out of the pain of staying the same. 
the crystallization of discontent. Now, what do we mean by revival? We got to define our terms. Colin Whitaker defines it as, quote, those special seasons of divine visitation when God, the Holy Ghost, quickens and stirs the slumbering church of God. Believers are set ablaze for Christ, and the power of God is so manifest in prevailing prayer and anointed preaching of the gospel that the most hardened and skeptical unbelievers are brought under conviction of sin leading in turn to genuine repentance and saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through his death on the cross and resurrection, end quote. Basically what Colin is saying is that revival is what happens when the Holy Spirit is in control of the church and is unleashed in the society. And the hunger, the hunger to experience Jesus in his fullness causes the saints of God to refuse Refuse to tolerate business as usual. Have you ever been that hungry for God? Where you, you just couldn't be held back any longer? Family relations, friends, none of that. You had to have Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you would do anything to get to him. We're going to look at a few people who wanted Jesus that badly. James Byrne says it this way, preceding revivals, before they take place, often there seems to be a widespread spirit of dissatisfaction. That's the crystallization of discontent. A widespread spirit of dissatisfaction among those God is preparing for what he is about to do. The heart of man begins to cry out for God, for spiritual certainties, for fresh visions, and from a faint desire, this multiplies until it becomes a vast human need, until in its urgency, it seems to beat with violence at the very gates of heaven. How's that for a word picture? It means people refuse to let him go until they get the refreshing that they so desperately need. Jesus was initiating the greatest revival and reformation of all time. Not another prophet, not another temple, not another scripture, but the living word of God. Can you imagine the word made flesh? Jesus stood before the people as the living embodiment of the very words of God. So this was something new on the scene. And in the middle of God's new thing, the people who claimed to be gods were clinging on to the same old thing. <laughs> Not much has changed in 2,000 years. God trying to do a new thing and people trying to cling to the same old thing. Same channel, same time. Not much has changed. But pretty soon, that disconnect became unbearable. I want to take you to Matthew chapter 21 and verses 12 to 17. The new and the old are going to come into collision here. Matthew chapter 21, starting at verse 12, I'm going to read through to verse 17. Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it into a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus, have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. This is such a strange look for Jesus as he teaches on prayer. You wouldn't expect this from Jesus. But sometimes effectual, fervent prayer calls for us to disturb the peace, to shake things up and beat with violence at the very gates of heaven. 
Ugandan pastor. I remember seeing him on a, on a video. And he was telling the testimony of how that country emerged from the tyranny of Idi Amin, the genocide and the, and the bloodshed under him. And then he was replaced by Milton Obote, who was supposed to be a, a, a better, more compassionate leader, but many of the same atrocities continued. And during those dark years, those dark times, the church went underground. And he talked about how the people, the saints of God, went out to meet and worship in the swamps. Because that was the only place where they could go and have worship a whole lot tougher than us wearing masks. But these believers were in the swamps holding on to their, their faith in God. And he made this statement because out of that came revival and the church began to explode and pretty soon the prime minister of Uganda was a Christian and most of the cabinet was too. It was a national revival. But listen to what he said in the aftermath. He said, revival comes from either desperation or devastation. He said, when it, come, when it came to us in Uganda, our revival came through devastation. He says, I don't recommend that. <laughs> Desperation, however, is what disturbs the peace. I want to look at some people in the Bible who disturb the peace. Bartimaeus is one such example. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. If you have the opportunity, you can turn there with me. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. They came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet, he's calling you. And throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Verse 51, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus. Your faith has healed you. What faith? What faith was Bartimaeus being commended for? What, what faith on the part of Bartimaeus um, affected his healing? It was his faith to disturb the peace and call on Jesus as a beggar, as a, as, as a blind beggar on the road. This man had no status. He had no clout and he had no business disturbing the procession with the Messiah, with the holy man Jesus in it. You as an outsider, you're unclean, you're on the fringes of society, you hold your peace. You be quiet, you back up. And Bartimaeus was not going to be denied and he broke protocol and said, Son of David, he recognized who Jesus was, by the way. That's a messianic title. Son of David, have mercy on me. And when they tried to shut him down, when they tried to put him back in his place, he just got louder. And Jesus said, your faith has healed you. It was the faith to persist through taboo, through societal norms, through the status quo, that faith that refused to let Jesus go without an encounter, that faith is what healed him. Exhibit one. Exhibit two is the woman with the hemorrhage. She also disturbed the peace. Mark chapter uh, five. So we're already in Mark. So just flip back 
a few chapters to Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 34. Okay? And what does it say there? A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you? His disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Again, what faith? The faith to break protocol and disrupt the procession and to touch Jesus. Number one, all kinds of taboos are being shattered in this story. Number one, she's a woman touching a man. Not done in that society. Number two, she has a hemorrhage. She is unclean, ritually unclean unclean. She's not even supposed to be outside. She's not even supposed to be in a crowd. Number three, she's touching a holy man, a rabbi. No clout, no status, no business being there. And she, trying to be secretive, says, if I can just, I don't want to make a scene, but if I can just touch the hem of his garment, that's all. If I can just get that close, then I will be made whole. And she does. She reaches up and she touches the hem of his garment. And healing virtue flows from Jesus. He knows the touch immediately. He says, somebody touch me. No, no, no. This isn't the common bumping and jostling. No, no, no. That's a touch of faith. That's a touch of persistence. That's a touch of discontent. The person who refuses to stay the way they are so that they can embrace what they can be. That's the difference. And it's that faith. He says, your faith has made you well. Well, how about another one? Exhibit three. Mark chapter two, verses one to 12. I don't have time to read it all, but you know the story. It's the healing of the paralytic. This is the one who was brought with four friends. Four friends brought him in a stretcher to the house where Jesus was teaching. But the crowd was so thick around the, the house that they couldn't get in. Did they go back home disappointed? No. They went up onto the roof, Holy Ghost boldness and ingenuity, and literally tore a hole in the roof while Jesus is there teaching. All of a sudden, dirt and grass and whatever starts to fall on Jesus' head. He looks up, light streams into the room, and there a stretcher is being laid down right in the middle of the meeting now, right in the middle of church, and here comes this man being lowered down the hole in front of him. And what does it say? Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith. Whose faith? The faith of the four friends. When he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven. Again, what faith is it? It was the faith to disturb the service and to tear a hole in the roof to get their friend to Jesus. That faith, a faith that was willing to disturb the meeting, <laughs> to disturb the peace. And then, of course, later, Jesus demonstrated his power as the Messiah and restored that paralytic. And he said, take up your bed and go home. Jesus himself disturbed the peace and, and racketeering of the money changers. Right? Desire of Ages, page 158, says this. He speaks, and his clear ringing voice, the same that upon Mount Sinai proclaimed the law that priests and rulers are transgressing, is heard echoing through the arches of the temple. Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Slowly descending the steps 
and raising the scourge of cords gathered up, uh, upon entering the enclosure, he bids the bargaining company to depart from the precincts of the temple. With a zeal and severity he has never before manifested, he overthrows the tables of the money changers. The coin falls ringing sharply upon the marble pavement. None presume to question his authority. None dare stop to gather up their ill-gotten gain. Jesus does not smite them with the whip of cords, but in his hand that simple scourge seems terrible as a flaming sword. Officers of the temple, speculating priests, brokers and cattle traders, with their sheep and oxen rush from the place with the one thought of escaping from the condemnation of his presence. A panic sweeps over the multitude who feel the overshadowing of his divinity. Cries of terror escape from hundreds of blanched lips. Even the disciples tremble. They are awestruck by the words and manner of Jesus, so unlike his usual demeanor. They remember that it is written of him, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Soon the tumultuous throng uh, with their merchandise are far removed from the temple of the Lord. The courts are free from unholy traffic and a deep silence and solemnity settles upon the scene of confusion. The presence of the Lord, that of old sanctified the mount, has now made sacred the temple reared in his honor. That's from Desire of Ages, page 158. Whether it is blind Bartimaeus, whether it, whether it is the woman with the issue of blood, whether it is the four friends who bring the paralytic, or even Jesus in the temple, in each case, the seeker was not to be denied. When are we going to stop preaching about revival and start disturbing the peace of our programs to get it? You see, there comes a point, there comes a time when talk must become action. And as our theme for the weekend says, the time is now. The time is now. A little while back, my wife and I joined LA Fitness pre-COVID. Why? Because our weight had plateaued. The body had adjusted to whatever it was we were doing or not doing. But we kept on doing the same old thing and hoped for better results. You know they call that insanity. Finally, we realized that we had to do something to break the impasse. We had to do something different. We told our kids about it, and they were just a little bit too excited for us. We had to disturb the peace of our plateau. And we still have to disturb the peace of our plateau. And that goes for the spiritual plateau as well. Desire of Ages, page 672, says, Only to those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for his guidance and grace, is the Spirit given. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. Now, how do we understand that word demand? It could be um, like Jacob when he uh, wrestled with the angel and said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Or... It could be, quote, I'm quoting now from the dictionary, the state of being wanted or sought for purchase or use. Uh, something that is in high demand. For instance, hand sanitizer. Huh? How about disinfectant? How about paper towels and toilet paper? Okay, during COVID, those items are in what? High demand. They are scarce. You have to get up early and often to be able to get those items because they are rare and they are in high demand. At camp meeting here at, on the campus of Auburn Adventist Academy under normal years, Wi-Fi is in high demand. <laughs> People come in to locating all the time and they say, uh, what's the Wi-Fi password? And we tell them what the password is, but we also tell them, you know, there's really only one good spot on campus where you get a good signal. And these are the hours that it's the best because after that, it drops off. We call it times of peak demand. We want it. Demand is high. There are other times when the demand is low. 
But the power of God today, it is unlimited bandwidth. And it's there for the asking. But is the demand high or low among us? We say we want power, but we settle instead for programs. We claim to want revival, but we settle for ritual. We keep doing the same things and expect different results. But this afternoon, God wants to disturb the peace of our resistance to having our peace disturbed. He wants us to want him. To demand him. With violence that seems to beat at the very gates of heaven. That's what he wants. Nothing ruins a cemetery like a good resurrection. <laughs> Think about it. A resurrection ruins the whole concept of a cemetery. Some people do not want, we have to admit though, that some people do not want to be disturbed from their pew coffins. Very comfortable, resting in peace every Sabbath in the pews. And don't want to be disturbed. But others, others want to awaken out of slumber. We talked about that last night. Lord, wake me. Jeremiah 29, 13, Amplified Version says this, Then with a deep longing you will seek me and require me as a vital necessity, and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. Let me ask you this. Are we seeking God at least as hard as we are seeking disinfectant in the grocery store? Are we seeking God at least as persistently as we are seeking toilet paper? Come on now. Then with a deep longing, it says, you will seek me and require me. It'll be a requirement on our part, not just optional. Require me as a vital necessity, more than our necessary food. The breath in our lungs, we need it. And you will find me, he says, when you search for me. How? Not casually, but with all of your heart. A camp meeting a couple of years ago. It was a real camp meeting, too, not virtual. I talked about our being there every single year on campus. And I asked the question, does it matter? Does it matter to the city of Auburn that we're here for 10 days? We still have a 10-day camp meeting here. Does it matter that we're here to the city of Auburn for 10 days? Does anyone know we're here? You certainly know in Seattle when Comic-Con is in town. Um, you certainly know when it's Pride Day in town. Even during camp meeting, you know that July 4 is... Uh, right around the corner because just down the street at the Muckleshoot Indian Reservation, they sell fireworks there and you hear the fireworks all day and late into the night. We know when the fireworks are here. We know when it's May Day. We even know when the vegetarians come to Seattle for VegFest. But does anyone know when the Adventists gather for their annual spiritual convocation. Anybody? I'm listening. Does anybody know? Does anybody care? Better question. Does it matter in hell that we're there? And I could ask the same question there of you good folks in Idaho when you gather on the campus of Jim State Academy. Does the city of Caldwell know you're there? Does it matter in hell that you're there? Are our prayers a disturbance to the kingdom of darkness? I've said that um, it, it, it should be, I, I mean, I've heard it said that we should live our lives in such a way that when we get up in the morning, Satan says, oh no, they're awake. Ellen White says this, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 124, there is nothing that Satan fears so much as the people of God 
shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. Let me read that again. There is nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. I know you don't use those words very often, languishing and impenitent. Let me break it down for you. Languishing means to fall ill, to exhibit signs of approaching death, to be listless, to pine, to grieve, to fall ill. It means to be weak or faint, to droop, fade, lose vigor or vitality. Vitality. We get our word impotence from this. To undergo neglect or experience prolonged inactivity, to be subjected to delay or disregard or to be ignored, like Bartimaeus, like the woman with the issue of blood, um, or the paralytic, weak, listless, prolonged inex uh, inactivity, and um, suffering neglect, disregarded, ignored. That's what it means to be languishing. And these three were languishing before they came encounter with Jesus. And Ellen White uses that word to describe the church. God wants to revive a languishing congregation, but also an impenitent congregation. What does impenitent mean? Impenitent means um, not repentant. Impenitent is the opposite of repentance. It means not feeling regret for one's sin or sins. In other words, you're in bad shape. You, you've got a hemorrhage. You're paralyzed. You're blind. But you're okay with it. It's a perfect description of Laodicea, who in reality is naked and poor and blind and miserable. That's the reality. But they're okay with it under the self-delusion that they are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. That would be the perfect description of a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. Unlike Bartimaeus and the others who disturbed the peace, the church has made peace with its paralysis in two many cases. The prolonged inactivity has become the status quo. I want to share with you a story from Francis Chan. Francis Chan and his daughter went to an underground church gathering in China some years ago. That's right, it was an underground church gathering. Young people were praying, he said, so passionately, begging God to send them to the most dangerous places. They were actually hoping to die as martyrs. Francis writes this, I had never seen anything like it. I still can't get over the fearless passion for Jesus this church embodied. As they shared stories of persecution, I sat in amazement and asked for more stories. After a while, they asked why I was so intrigued. I told them that the church in America was nothing like this. I can't tell you how embarrassing it was to try to explain to them that people attend 90-minute services once a week in buildings that we call church. And I told them about how people switch churches if they find better teaching, more exciting music, or more robust programs for their children. As I began to describe the church in America, they began to laugh. Not just small chuckles. They were laughing hysterically. I felt like a stand-up comedian, but I was simply describing the American church as I've experienced it. They found it laughable that we could read the same scriptures they were reading and then create something so incongruent. And you know what? Satan laughs too. Because as long as the church remains in this condition, Satan has nothing to worry about. But, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 124, when the way is prepared for the Spirit of God, the blessing will come. Satan can no more hinder a shower of blessing from descending upon God's people than he can close the windows of heaven that rain cannot come upon the earth. Wicked men and devils cannot hinder the work of God or shut out his presence from the assemblies of his people. 
if they will with subdued contrite hearts confess and put away their sins and in faith claim his promises. My friends, revival comes only in answer to prayer, prayer that disturbs the peace of our paralysis. Francis Chan goes on to say, if prayer isn't vital for your church, then your church is not vital. And to that I say, amen. You go on and look at, um, you know, back to where we were in Matthew at the, at the uh, cleansing of the temple. And Jesus in verses 18 through 22, uh, Matthew chapter 21, goes on to curse the fig tree. <laughs> why, why is he picking on that poor fig tree? What did the fig tree ever do to Jesus? It lied. You see, the fig tree was guilty of bait and switch. It advertised off-season figs, but upon closer inspection, it hung out a sign that said, not in season. In too many churches, there are signs that, that upon closer inspection say, not in season. Which is an oxymoron, of course, because we're told in scripture that we're to be prepared in season and out of season. In COVID or out of COVID. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. 2 Timothy 4.2 the fig tree was a reflection of what was going on in the temple and in the nation. Neither was fulfilling the purposes of God or man. Its leaves were saying one thing and then doing another. It had the form of fruitfulness while denying the figs thereof. Jesus, in this scenario with the fig tree, brings up prayer again. Verses 21 and 22. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Believing prayer gets rid of the obstacles to God and overturns all pretense of piety. It doesn't settle for, for leaves and no fruit. It clears the way for God to pour out his spirit on a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. It allows him to bring fruit on a fruitless tree. My friends, will you pray to disturb the peace? Back in New Hebrides, the New Hebrides Revival of 1949, Barvis Parish, Lewis Island. Two women, 84 years of age, 84 and 82, one blind. They began to pray because there were no young people in the church at all, none. The church was languishing. They began to pray. One had a vision of the church filled with young people. They called for the minister and for the leaders to pray in a barn with them on Tuesday and Fridays. This went on for a month and a half. Finally, they felt impressed to invite Duncan Campbell, a prominent evangelist at that time, to come and be there. And when Duncan received the invitation, he said, I had no, I had no impression, no burden to, to go to Barvis. Besides, I had another meeting in another part of the parish. <laughs> but the women simply responded, well, you, you need to pray to God more. <laughs> Within a week, Duncan Campbell was there with the women on the Isle of Lewis, Barvis Parish. And they began to hold meetings. And there was one meeting in particular. It was um, nice to... The house was full, and Duncan got up to preach, and he preached until about 9.30, 10 o'clock, and everything was, was, was normal and well. They gave the benediction. They're marching down the aisle, getting ready to leave for the night, and then one of the young men who was in the barn with those two old ladies who had claimed the promise in Isaiah that I will pour water on the thirsty and floods upon the dry ground, one of those young men stopped in the middle of the aisle and said, God, you cannot fail us. You said that you would pour water on the thirsty and we are thirsty. You cannot fail us now. 
and the young man fell to his knees and then fell into what some described as a trance. In the meantime, someone came rushing from the back aisle and they said, Mr. Campbell, Mr. Campbell, come quick, come quick, you've got to see this. And, and he, they took him out to the front of the church and there the church was filled with around 500 people, most of them young people, young adults. Here it was almost 10 o'clock at night. Where had they come from? Well, there had been a dance that night uh, from the local school and the children and the and the, the faculty were there at that dance, having no thought of God or salvation, their eternal destiny, anything like that during the dance. But then all of a sudden, the Spirit of God descended on the dance hall, and those young people felt a burden and a compulsion to seek salvation and to seek God. They didn't know what to do with what they were feeling, and they ran like the building was on fire and made for the church. And there they were, 500 strong, with their teachers, on their knees weeping, saying, what must we do to be saved? Duncan Campbell began to minister and to pray to those gathered young people there. This went on for at least another 45 minutes or an hour. It's now getting late. And they decide, well, maybe we should get a bite to eat or something. But then comes the word, Mr. Campbell, Mr. Campbell, you've got to come to the police station. The police station, why? Another crowd of about three to 400 people were gathered outside the police station, people in their bedclothes, robes, slippers, pajamas, what had wakened them out of sleep at that time of night? The Spirit of God had fallen on the town and people made for the police station. And there Duncan Campbell ministered to them until the wee hours of the morning. It was a powerful revival that swept the island of Lewis. And it was because it was a prayer that refused to be denied. Lord, you promised that you would pour water on the thirsty, and we are thirsty. He could have just gone up, that young man. The service was over. It was time to go home. It could have been business as usual, just another nice service. But that's not why that young man was there. He wasn't there for another nice service. They had been praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on a languishing church. And they weren't leaving until they got it. What are the results of prayer that disturbs the peace? Well, purity and presence of God. Look at verse 12. Still in Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Jesus came into the house to clean up the mess. The purity and the presence of God returned to his sanctuary. The second thing that took place is prayer. Verse 13, Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Is it that or is it a house of horrors? <laughs> We've got various emails in some churches circulating, accusing leadership of being unfaithful and, and, and running discouraged members away. This happens in church after church after church. I wish it wasn't that way, but it's true. People causing um, discord among the brethren. But Jesus says, my house should be called a house of prayer, not a house of horrors or gossip. The third thing that returns when prayer disturbs the peace, is power and ministry. Verse 14, Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. You know what? In, in our churches, and um, hold on, I, I need to back up on that a little uh, again. Yes. Um, the people were, were healed. They healed. I, I'm sorry, I, I turned to the wrong page. My, my pages were stuck together. That's why I couldn't make sense of it. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. Power and ministry returned to the church of God. In our churches, somebody ought to be getting healed, okay? Somebody ought to be getting healed. And then number four, verse 15, praise among the young people. 
verse 15. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They were praising God and out of the lips of children and infants came forth praise. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, Joel says. Your young will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Before revival, not a single young person was in the church in Barvis. Afterwards, hundreds were saved. Well, my question is, what if our time is now? What if we're here, not just for another prayer retreat, but to restore and reflect the glory of our King who finds the status quo, our status quo, unbearable. How then should we pray? Well, don't wait for great faith. Use the faith that you already have and use it now. Get in good trouble right now. We don't need the biggest church the best band, the cutting edge technology, or the hottest evangelism strategy because all we need is all we have and all we have is all we need because all we need is God and in Him we have everything. I challenge you to disturb the peace, to pray Habakkuk's prayer in Habakkuk 3 verse 2. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. O Lord, renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. This will cause a disturbance to you and to your church, your home. Will you do it? Will you pray that way? You who call on the Lord, Isaiah 62, 6 and 7. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her a praise of the earth. I challenge you this evening, my friends, as we close the Sabbath hours together, believe in something and pray about the right things, even if it means sacrificing everything. That's the only way things change. That's the only way revival comes. Will you answer the call to disturb and be disturbed? Pray with me. Father God, thank you for caring enough about us to disturb our peace. You don't do it to be mean. You do it because you love us and you want us to experience you in your fullness. We settle for so little when you offer us so much. And when I think about the things that are in high demand in our life, toilet paper, disinfectant, and I think about how we treat you and the things of God, it's, it's shameful. I pray that at least you are in as high a demand in our experience as is toilet paper. Dear God, come in and may we be willing to beat with violence at the very gates of heaven. You promised that you would send, you would pour water on the thirsty. And Lord, we confess we are thirsty. Would you send the rain? Help us not to be languishing and okay with it. Help us to understand that this is the time of our visitation and this is the time to disturb the peace. Wake us, Lord, before it's too late because we want to see you in peace when you come again. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My friends, right after this, I believe at 4.30, uh, Karen Pearson and her team will open the Zoom room. You can find it, I'm sure, in the chat that's running right now alongside this program. Karen has placed the Zoom link uh, for that. Or if you go to the Idaho Conference Prayer Ministries page, you'll find the Zoom room link there, and you'll be able to access the Zoom room which will take place at 4.30, and you guys will have a time of prayer, a season of prayer. And I would pray that, or hope that you would pray into the things that we've discussed tonight. Where in your life does God need to create a disturbance? Where are you satisfied with the status quo? Okay, and then pray into that and let God disturb your peace. Tomorrow morning, we will be on again at 9.00. 30 a.m. Mountain Time, 9.30 a.m. for the fourth and final presentation. The time is now to pray different. That's tomorrow morning at 9.30. Uh, 
I will see you then. Until then, good night. God bless.